Hi, everybody. This is a continuation of uh, chapter 27 again, uh, talking about the magnetic field and uh, how we introduced it so far. And we did several applications of this concept. Uh, the remaining topics that are actually big in terms of homework and, uh, and uh, exams are the two topics, or at least what appears to be two topics, but they are left more than two, actually. And this two, uh, these two together now. So let's talk about the magnetic flux. The magnetic flux is defined similarly to what we define the electric flux, namely we use the similarity with the uh, hydrodyna hydrodynamics. And except now we basically just define it as uh, we go. So we have an area in here. This is a surface. And we have a magnetic field in here. The surface is an oriented object. In other words, surface is actually a vector whose direction is given by the right-hand rule too. So if I take a surface, for example, that is made up of this vector, this is what we're going to call the length of that, uh, at some point of that area, and this is going to be the width of that area. So the area is the measurement of this surface, basically, in terms of magnitude, in terms of direction, is given by the right-hand rule. L cross W gives me the area A. So this is an area. So the area itself is actually a vector, for this rectangle in here, it's L cross with W. It matters the cross product. So if I do W cross L, it's going to be probably the same. It's going to be the same magnitude of the area, but it's going to be pointing downward. In other words, if I take this area and circle it, circulate it this way, go L, then W. This is still W, by the way. So if I go in this direction, then the area is given by the right-hand rule. In other words, actually, it's given by either this right-hand rule, where this is, let me go back into this analogy in here. So this will be L, this will be W, and this will be where the area is. Also, if I circulate the area in one direction, then this is its vector direction. So it's still be given by this right-hand rule, too. So in other words, if you take your, your palm, basically, and curl your fingers around where the area is curling. So if I curl around this direction in here in such a way, I'm going from L to W, and then coming back to where I started from, with my, then the pointing in here, the thumb, will point toward the area too. So that's a vector-oriented. So if I do it in the opposite direction, the area will point downward. In other words, if I start from my palm this way and then circulated in the opposite direction, then the area will be a vector of the same magnitude, but the, it points downward. So the area is a vector and it's also given by the right hand rule. And uh, so think about this area and I have here an angle that they make, not necessarily 90 degrees, but any uh, angle in there. Then in this case, the magnetic field flux is defined similarly as I defined it for the electric field, except now I addressed it with the letter B just to indicate that this is a flux. And it's the sum of this quantity, namely the magnetic field, dotted with every single element of area dA. So imagine with me that this is a patch of the area whose magnitude is dA and whose direction is given by the right-hand rule. Then all I have to do is do this dot product. This is the dot product. This is the cosine of the angle between them. Then this is what the magnetic flux is. The magnetic flux is measured in Weber. I mean, it's Tesla times meter squared. So that's the unit for the magnetic field. So it's going to be a Tesla meter squared. And again, this is known as the Weber, I think, WB. Okay. For the units of the magnetic flux. Now, uh, don't worry about the Weber. Just, just stick with the SI units in here. Just use the t Tesla meter square. Don't use the Gauss when you're dealing with this unit in here, unless, of course, you have the powers and everything else defined. Now, let me talk about an important concept in here, namely the fact or the version of Gauss's law for the case of the magnetic field. Remember, if I have a closed surface, so now. That definition is for any surface. Okay, so this is the magnetic flux. It doesn't matter what surface you're talking about. Open, closed, it doesn't matter. 
the magnetic flux now for a closed surface. This is a special case. So we take a surface, think about it, a, a basketball, for example, or it doesn't matter, it doesn't have to be a regular shape, it can be any shape, as long as it's closed, okay? So in this case, this is a surface. I'm trying to draw some of its lines in here at the top. Then, if I have a magnet in here, a bar magnet, this is its north pole, and this is its south pole, a magnetic field will leave, and let's say, for example, it's gonna cross the surface because if it doesn't cross, it's irrelevant, okay? so it's, it's trivial. Let's go say it crosses the surface. It cannot stop there. It's going to go and come back at some point to come back to the South Pole. That is basically what the properties of the magnetic field is, since I have a pair of them, north, south, together. So if I have a line that comes in, in here and I calculate this integral, this, this product in here, remember the area is pointing somewhere in here, for example, this is going to be a negative uh, cross product because this is direction of B, and this is the area A, and the angle is more than 90 degrees, so definitely this number is neg negative. However, in here, when the area was this way and the magnetic field is this way, of course, B times the area is going to be a positive number. So in this case, there is a negative contribution from one side and a positive contribution to, to the other side. And at the end of the day, they will cancel out because if I consider any other field line, so if this done balance, the other one will balance it for sure. So this will add just enough to cancel what the other one has just had negative. And at the end of the day, I will have no magnetic flux going through, no net magnetic flux going through closed surface. That's the point I want to emphasize on. Now, I took the example in here where the, the poles are actually sitting inside the, I mean, the dipole, the magnetic field, the magnet is inside, outside of the surface. How about if I take a magnet and put it inside the surface? There is no problem in here. So if I take the surface in here, and so this is a magnetic field. Now, this is a magnetic, this is the area, this is a magnetic field. Both of them are in the same direction. So this is gonna be a positive contribution. But ultimately, at some point, it needs to penetrate back the surface and in which case the magnetic field will pointing this way, the area is pointing in that way, and so that this cosine of that angle is gonna be a negative number and there will be no net magnetic field again. The fundamental reason why this is so is because it can never isolate the North Pole from the South Pole. A magnetic field line will leave the North Pole and ultimately will end up back in the South Pole immediately next to it. So they decide, you know what, I want to have the North Pole by itself. So when I take, come in here, I take this magnet and cut it in half and decide, no, can I have this by itself as a North Pole and this one by a South Pole? No. Experience has shown that I will end up with a new magnet in such a way this will remain in our Pole, probably changes uh, uh, its position a little, and this one will split itself into North and South, and this will remain the South Pole. So now I end up with two magnets. You know what? How about if I continue this process? Ignore this one for a moment. I'm going to cut this into two pieces. No matter how much I repeat this process, I will all, always end up with basically a new magnet whose magnetic north is pointing in one direction and south pointing in the other direction. And if I continue this process for uh, on the atomic level, at some point I will lose magnetism. So magnets, they come in pairs of north and south or not at all. Either you have north, south, and south poles south uh, north pole and south pole together or nothing at all so because of that situation magnetic field always is such a way that it always comes back to its start, uh, starting point and because of that if a field line enters a region that is closed it's going to leave it no matter what and at the end of the day you will have known as flux so i'm going to state this one in here and say the equivalent of Gauss's law on closed surface of the flux, the magnetic flux. Remember, this is a dot product, not the cross product. So at the end of the day, I have a number in here. The cross product gives you vectors, the dot product gives you numbers. This is gonna be zero. This is as simple as it can get. So this is the version of Gauss's law For magnetism, that is it. I mean, it's as simple as that. 
And the reason why, if somebody asks you, okay, why is it zero? Well, because there are no monopoles. Always you have a north pole and a south pole in pairs. That's it. So the flux of a, of the magnetic field over a closed surface is zero, period. End of the story. That's nice. In a sense, I mean, when we're dealing with the uh, when we dealt with the electric field, and I'm just going to connect these two points because they are very, very important. The flux of the electric field, if you guys remember from Gauss's law for the electric field over closed surface, was equal to the charge enclosed over epsilon naught. And because I could isolate the positive charges or the negative charges, or some negative charges and some positive charges, and at the end, I will have some net charges, which may or may not be zero. At the end of the day, the flux may or may not be zero for, that, uh, for the electric field. However, for the magnetic field, it's always zero. This has tremendous implication in that the magnetic field, and you can clearly see from this one, does not flow, but rather it goes around in circles. So that's really an important concept in here that uh, the magnetic field does not flow. It circulates. This 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 ideas in here are important because we will uh, we will we will discuss this in terms of the of calculations later on and we will define what the circulation is and once we define what the circulation is we will find what that means and it's going to be related to our old friend the electron motor force so again these are important uh, subjects in here and uh, I, I want to expedite a little bit this recording so that we don't have a lot of record videos for one chapter. So I'm going to talk about the, um, the, the, the effects, if you wish, of, uh, of the uh, magnetic field on, on a wire, OK? Remember, let me, let, me, let, me, let me draw a wire. I'm going to take a simple case in here. I have a wire in here sitting inside the magnetic field. For simplicity's case, I'm going to take the magnet going pointing inside. So I have a wire that has a current I running through it. Remember when we discussed the current, we found that the current is, this is from chapters 20, uh, uh, 20, 26, I think, when we did the, uh, the current, namely the fact that the, uh, it's, it's related to the number of charge carriers times uh, their density. Each charge carrier is carrying a charge N. And if the material gives me n charges per unit volume, and uh, each, on average, they are drifting with a velocity v. We call that the drift velocity vd when we average all the velocities after all of the charges entered into collisions and came out. So this was basically what we defined as being the current. Uh, now, or at least when we when we came up with a theory to explain what the current was. So this is, if you wish, one way of looking at the current. And uh, each one of these charges now, since they're moving with velocity v, so think about this, this one as your drift velocity pointing upward, and the magnetic field is pointing to, to uh, going inward. So now I have v going up, the magnetic, so this, the, magne uh, the uh, magnetic field going uh, into the uh, surface in here, into the uh, screen. So that means that this magnet in here, or this, this wire in here, each charge is going to be subject to a force given by VD times its charge crossed with B, and that is going to be on individual charges. Sorry, I forgot the area in here. So this is a cross-section in here. So there must be a cross-section in here, okay, for the wire. 
So uh, this is going to be, each charge is going to be subject to this force, Fb. The combination of this uh, 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 or if you wish if I was sum this because of this this charges because this is individual charge and I'm talking about an n times a times l so this is the length of the wire in here because the volume is l times a and in this volume I have n charges so at the end n per unit charge that is so this is the density of the charge carriers times the volume which is l a namely the cross section is A and the length of the wire I'm taking it to be L. So at the end of the day, the total force, so this is on an individual charge. So this is an ice charge, if you wish, okay? But because we average these quantities, so they're all going to be the same value. So when I sum it, at the end, the entire wire will be subject to this force, which is the sum of all of these charges. Remember, I have n charges per unit volume, and the volume I'm taking in here is of length L, the wire, and of cross-section A. So at the end of the day, basically, I have to multiply these charges by this number. So remember, this is a number now of charges, because this is number of charges per unit volume, and this is the volume, so the number, the units cancel at the end of the day. I will have n times L times A, A is the cross-section, I'm sorry, times Q times V, the drift times B. Now I'm gonna do a switching in here. I'm gonna switch two things in here. And the two things I'm gonna switch are L as a vector and V as a vector. The reason why I'm switching these two is because they are parallel. L is parallel to the drift velocity. In other words, this, when I average all of this velocities, I found that the, the charges are moving in the wire itself. They're moving up and down in this wire. So V and L as vector are parallel to one another, which means that uh, in this cross product, when I cross VD crossed with B times L is actually the same thing as VD times L crossed with B, because these two vectors have the same magnitude, and because L and B form the same angle as V and D, therefore this is an identity, okay? If you have any questions about this, or if you think that this is not clear enough, please let me know during the discussion, the live discussion, so that we can clarify this one further, okay? Or you can submit your question in the note, in the discussion in the uh, on Canvas. Anyway. So then the magnetic force on a wire can be expressed as the following. N, the charge density, or the density of the charge carriers, I should say, times uh, Q, times the area A, times VD as a scalar, times L crossed with B. Well, this is nothing but the current inside the wire. So at the end of the day, the magnetic force on a wire that has a current I running through it is given by this expression, where L is a vector pointing in the direction of the wire through the wire itself. So this is the length of the wire, okay? And this is B, the magnetic field, and this is what the wire is. So this is an important concept, and it's really, I mean, in terms of magnitude, it's easy to do. I mean, in magnitude, all you have to do is just worry about the uh, uh, the product of I times L times B times the sign of the angle between L and B. So remember, there is an angle between them. In this case, I took them to be perpendicular to one another because I took the magnetic field to be pointing inward, whereas the wire... I mean, inside the surface, but inside the screen, that is. So anything on the screen itself is going to be definitely perpendicular. So that's how the wire is going to be basically pu pu pushing to the left. I mean, you will see the wire bending. And actually, this is an experiment that you that was done early on, where basically they run wires through um, that are from ceiling to uh, to the from the ceiling from the ceiling to the ground, 
And the current that is running through it, they put the whole wire inside the magnet and they saw, they noticed that the magnet bent. So you might think, wait a minute, can I explain this in terms of charges? Hey, or let's talk about this one later on because we want to also to discuss something in here which is very important. And we'll talk about uh, the effects of a wire on a wire, but once we get into the next chapter, actually. So that's going to be, uh, we'll have some interesting discussions then and there. Uh, okay, so let's close this chapter by talking about the, uh, the loop, okay? And that's going to be the last topic in terms of content, and then after that, we're going to talk about application. So think about this one as I have a wire that has, that is closed, and, and practically this is not possible. You really have to have it this way if you wish, okay? So that there is a current that comes in, goes, come here, this way, and then comes out. Because there is no way that you can think of the current going this way and coming through a closed loop. So this practically, this is not uh, practical, but this is more of how it works actually in practice. So I have a wire in here, and all of it is inside a magnetic field. So I'm gonna put the whole thing inside the magnetic field. So there is a magnet in here. And again, I'm gonna take a uniform magnet. Okay, we're dealing with magnetostatics in here. Magnets don't change direction or magnetic. So once we have them fixed, they are fixed back. So now, uh, basically what I want to do is I'm gonna come in here and look at this wire differently. So I'm gonna come to this side and look at it. Sorry, to this side and look at it, okay? So let's look at it that way. So this is how the wire looks like. I'm looking at it sideways. This is where the mag magnetic field is. It's going pointing upward. From this perspective, I see the current coming up on this side, and then it's going to dive in into this region, go all the way to the other side, and then come out from this side, from the bottom. Let's look at it again from the top to see what's going on. So again, it's going to come out from here. So. From my other view in here, I'm gonna assume that this is of length L. So the wire has a length L and a width W. So I'm taking a rectangular shape in here. So on the L side, the current is running from the bottom on my screen from uh, left to right. And then on this side that I'm looking at in here from down to up, okay? And then from here, it's going from right to left. And then on the, this side, it's going from bottom to, to uh, from top to bottom. So again, what I'm looking in here in this picture is W, that's all. I'm not looking at anything else in here. So this is my W. On the W, it's going from bottom to, uh, to the top. And then it goes from to the inside the surface, if you wish, inside the screen. And then on the other side that I can't see from this angle, and have the current coming down, and then it's going to merge on the other side. So that's how it looks like to me. Okay, so let's calculate the forces on this thing. First of all, the size, of, the size of W. The magnetic field is going up and down, and the wire is coming, uh, uh, is coming to the. I mean, with the current is going up and down. So this is the current I in it. So that's what the vector in here is. So this is the current I. So this is the current I again in this bottom picture. And I'm gonna apply that expression that I just found. I times the length W in here times the, uh, the uh, B times the sign of the angle between them. Ignore the sign for, for a moment right now. Uh, actually, it's important right now to find what that angle is. Okay, the wire itself is making an angle uh, of this angle in here. Let me get the angle correctly in here because I, want, I don't want to uh, confuse things. So again, where the length so this is the angle that we're talking about in here, whatever it is, okay? It's that angle that we're talking about. So that angle, uh, let's look at the direction now. So the L is pointing up on this direction and the B is up. So the force is actually coming out 
force up in here, this direction. So if I'm representing the force, so this is where the magnetic force is going to be coming out on this side. But on the other side, the situation is just the same in terms of the magnetic field. The current is pointing down, so the force is going to be pointing on the other direction. So on the other side, so let's look at it from this angle in here, because this is kind of a little bit tricky if you're not paying too close attention. So on this side, the magnetic force is pointing this way. And on this side, the magnetic force is pointing that way. The magnitude is absolutely the same thing because the orientation, the angles are the same. The magnitudes of B are the same. The width is the same. The current is the same. So the forces are the same, except that they are opposite in direction. So what this magnet is trying to do is trying to basically destroy the wire, trying to basically expand the wire on both sides. We're going to assume that the wire is rigid. So the net effect of these two forces is that they cancel out and the story, we don't have a problem whatsoever, correct? So the only thing that we have to think about now is this side in here, the top side and the bottom side. Those are the problem that we have to think about. Again, for this situation, the magnetic field is going up, as we can see from this direction in here. And the current is going into the ball. So they are making a 90 degree angle. As long as anything is going in or out of the surface in here, it's making a 90 degree angle. So the sign of 90 degree angle is going to be, uh, is going to be one. So we don't worry about that, uh, that side. The only thing that we have to worry about the is the direction. So again, the current is going in, the magnet is going up. So if I apply the right hand rule, this is where the magnetic field on this side is. And its value, F, I'm going to call it B in here, F of B for the top side is going to be given simply by uh, the current, which is I, times the length L times B times sine of 90 degrees, which is just 1. That is the reason why 90 degrees, again, is because of the fact that they make a, a, a 90 degree angle because of the fact that the current is going in. Anything is going in is going to be perpendicular to anything on this surface including the magnetic field. Now, from the bottom, let's see what's going on in the bottom in here. It's the same situation as before, except the current now has reverse direction and the L has reverse direction. B is still pointing upward. The current is coming out, so I'm gonna follow the current out, point the magnetic field to the top, then the net, force, if you use your head, right hand rule correctly, should be pointing in this direction, and that is basically what this force is. The magnitude is going to be exactly the same thing, I, L, the length of the wire, times B, times sine of 90 degrees. So these two forces are equal in magnitude, and uh, they are not really, the, yes, they cancel out, they don't move the loop in one way or the other, at least the center of mass of the loop doesn't move, but something moved. And the fact that this is trying to spin this uh, loop in this direction, and this is actually trying to spin it this way. So this torque actually is negative torque because it's clockwise. And this torque also is negative, clock because, uh, negative torque because it's actually clockwise. And what they are trying to do, they were trying to spin it in such a way that this is the area basically A for the whole loop itself. Remember, the loop is going per right-hand rule. So if I follow this direction, follow this direction and that direction, so this is the area. It's coming out, actually, of the surface. So this is, and it's making 90 degree angle with the loop itself. So let's keep that in mind. So this is the area A of the loop itself. This area A, in magnitude is equal to LW, but it's in direction, it's pointing up in this, this way. So once the, once the torque basically acts on it, it's gonna make B and A parallel at the end of the day. So it's trying to rotate it. Let's find the torque now. Because we're talking rotation, we're talking torque now. So torque can be computed around any point. <coughs> What happened in here to my screen? So the torque is trying to rotate this one in here. So let's find tau. Tau can be computed around any, because this thing is 
really, uh, uh, there is a theorem actually that you got this in physics 250 that states basically calculating the torque around any point in here should give me the same value. This video is trying, I don't want to really make it too long. So let's calculate the torque around this point. Once I calculate the torque around this point, this force has no torque because the center of rotation, you can calculate it anywhere. You can calculate it in the middle if you like, and we can have this discussion further in the classroom. So I'm going to take this center of rotation here. So this force has no torque. So the only thing that is going to be of interest to me is this, this force, the top one. So the torque in magnitude is going to be the magnitude of the force itself, A, uh, the force, which is ILB, times the width W times the sine of the angle, this angle, okay? And this angle actually is related to this angle in here. Let me, let me, let me draw the magnetic field from this point, because remember, I have the magnetic field in there. So I'm going to call this angle theta. And I'm going to argue that these two angles are the same. Let's see why. This side of theta is perpendicular to this side of that angle. And this side of theta is perpendicular to the other side of the, this angle. Therefore, these two angles are the same because of, there is a theorem in geometry that says if two angles have perpendicular uh, corresponding sides, therefore they must be the same angle. So this is sine of theta. And L times W is nothing but this area itself in magnitude. So at the end of the day, tau is equal to I A times B, because again, LW is uh, A times sine theta. By the way, this A has nothing to do with the A where we talked about the, uh, for, the, for the wire itself, okay? So this A is actually for the loop, okay? And the other A that we were talking about is for the wire that has a current running through it. So please don't confuse the symbols in here. I hope that you guys are paying too close attention to make that distinction. Anyway, an important idea in here is the following. Vector A itself is making that angle theta. The measurement of that angle A, that uh, that vector B, I should say B and A, not uh, A and B, okay, is actually theta, okay, the vector B and A. And therefore, A and B is minus theta. And since this torque is actually a negative number, so actually I'm going to take the whole thing in, uh, in symbolically and write the whole torque itself now as simply being uh, tau as a vector as nothing but the quantity i a as a vector crossed with b. So this is what the torque is. I'm going to define this quantity now as the magnetic moment. The magnet Remember when we talked about the electrical dipole and we defined the electrical dipole moment? So this is going to be an equivalent expression instead of the charge multiplying by the distance between the positive and the negative charge. So this is going to be my magnetic moment, which is similar to the uh, electric uh, moment when we, uh, dipole moment, when we defined it, remember, and we found that P tau for the electrical dipole to be related to P crossed with the electric field E. This is something that we saw last time, uh, I mean, a few chapters back, where P was defined as being simply uh, Q, Q times the, the, the vector distance between the negative charge and the positive charge. So we defined it as in the x direction so to a i, where i hat basically was the direction between the ne from the negative to the positive charge, and the distance was to a actually between the positive char the charges. In this case, mu is going to be defined as i equivalent to q times area uh, uh, equivalent to that vector distance between the charges. And because I don't have monopoles in here, I have a loop of current, so this is its moment. This is an important relationship. I cannot emphasize how important it is because it's going to give me a lot of concepts, a lot of uh, applications that we're going to be doing there later on. One more point in here, and we're going to close this chapter. So I'm going to talk about the energy in two ways. First of all, I'm going to talk about it in terms of, uh, of uh, the dipole energy. For a loop. In a, magnet, in a magnetic field. And then we're going to talk about the energy that the magnetic field uh, 
uh, does in general, the work that the magnetic force does in general. Okay, so remember that we just found the force, or I'm sorry, the torque to be equal to uh, mu times b times sine of theta. We just found it up there, okay? Where theta is the angle between them. So the amount of work that is related to this quantity in here, where if I move the loop slightly from one position to the other will be given, so this is dw in general, is going to be tau times d theta. So in other words, this is mu b sine theta d theta. In other words, I have a loop that is already in a certain configuration with the, uh, with the magnetic field. What I'm going to do is I'm going to move it in one way, and that's going to give me the, uh, the, uh, the, the force, basically, that is responsible for this displacement. If I work out the integral trying to find the entire work that is ne necessary to displace a, a loop inside the magnetic field by a certain amount theta, all I have to do is just integrate this expression, and that's going to give me the integral of minus mu b of cosine theta, and the reason why, again, is there is a minus is because the integral of a, cos, uh, of a sine is a negative cosine. Well, since mu is a vector, d is a vector, and theta is the angle between these two vectors, this is nothing but the dot product. So the work in this case, or the energy stored in a magnet, is equal to this amount, minus mu times b times, well, these two are just vectors. So this is the dot product of the two. Again, this is very, very similar to what we were, when we did the, uh, the dipole, there the energy was equal to minus pe, in this case, the energy is equal to minus mu b. Okay, so this is simply there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the electrical dipole, where we talk about the dipole moment there being just equal to p, uh, which is the product of a charge times the distance between the negative and positive charges. In here, the magnetic moment is related to the current times the area, and the area is given by the right-hand rule. Okay. So that's basically the, the difference between them. Algebraically, at least symbolically, they're the same expression whether we're talking about the torque or about the energy. They have the same idea. All the loop is trying to do is actually align itself in such a way at the end of the day so that its uh, uh, magnetic field and the area point in the same direction. So that's basically what this means. This is, has immediate applica applications, and that is motors. For a motor, and I'm thinking to have that as a project for you guys to work on, for a motor, basically, what you have, you have a magnet. Think of it as either a horseshoe or a big magnet so that there is a north on one side and south on the other side. And there is a loop in here. So practically, like I said, you need to have a current coming out on the other side. So if the current is coming from one side, it's going to come out from the other. So there is a battery in here at some point in here. And that is generating the current. So as this thing starts to spin one way or the other, it's going to continue spinning. And uh, the inertia will force it so that it moves in one way or the other. And at the end, you're going to have to have a permanent motion. Again, because this is what the direction of the magnetic field is, so all you're trying to do is align the area A and the B in there. Again, we're going to have more problems than this one, and this probably will have tremendous implications in terms of exams, like I said before, and also in terms of the projects, and also in terms of the, in terms of the homework problems. So this is an important concept, and it's all based on those two relationships. There's, first of all, the torque and the energy of a system. Okay. Uh, the final point in here, and that is the, in, the work that the magnetic force does in general. Okay, that's important. So think with me for a moment, okay? So here is uh, a charge. I'm gonna go back to uh, the same concept that we talked about. So we have a charge Q, V, moving inside the magnet. This is the force that it is going to be subject to. This is the Lorentz force. Okay, so this is a charge moving inside the magnetic field with the velocity V. And if I'm interested trying to find how much work this magnetic force will do, all I have to do is just multiply by the displacement, or let's find the power. So the power is equal to force times velocity. This is something that you have seen. This is the dot product, not the cross product, times velocity. So if I do that, 
then the power that the magnetic force will deliver for a charge moving with a velocity v inside the magnetic field will be given by qv crossed with b and dotted with v. Well, this is perpendicular to v. No matter what, it's perpendicular to v and b. But of a particular interest, it's perpendicular to v. And this is v itself. So this product, at the end of the day, will involve a cosine of an angle that is 90 degrees. So it's going to involve cosine of 90 degrees, and the power will be zero. No matter which way you think about it, the magnetic field does not deliver any power, hence does not do any work at all. Doesn't matter what time of the week, whether it's a weekend or a not a weekend, magnetic force does no work, period. So it never delivers power. And that's because immediately it has to do with this cross product business. So this is in a nutshell, basically the entire chapter. So I'm going to finish it in here. I know that's probably a long recording. And I will see you in class and we'll discuss all of these points in class and we'll also do application. Thank you.